Hello and welcome to the Dizziness and Balance video series by the Ear and Balance Institute. I am your host, Dr. Jerry Gianoli, and I am a board-certified neurootologist. Neurootology is the medical specialty that deals with inner ear dizziness and balance disorders. This video series is intended to be educational and not intended to be medical advice. For individual medical advice, please speak with your own physician. Welcome back. We are going today to talk about uh, something called third mobile window syndrome, or an easier way to think about it is, is holes in your inner ear that cause vertigo, dizziness, and balance problems, as well as some auditory symptoms. The most commonly recognized third mobile window syndrome is something called superior semicircular canal dehiscence. It's the most commonly recognized one, but there's a whole bunch of other disorders that can cause the same syndrome. And uh, its superior canal dehiscence isn't even the most common one. Um, we've recently published a book on this uh, topic. It's called Third Mobile Window Syndrome of the Inner Ear uh, Superior Semicircular Canal Dehiscence and Associated Disorders. And if anyone's interested in it, it's available for purchase. Uh, although I'm the editor, I have 60 co-authors uh, writing about 30 different chapters on the book. So if you really want to dig into this topic, that would be very helpful for you. So let's talk about third mobile window syndrome. First of all, the inner ear, uh, if you remember back to our anatomy video, is encased in very solid bone. And there's only two areas that are kind of weak spots or mobile windows. That's the round window and the oval window. So two normal mobile windows. The oval window is where the last ear bone sits. That's the stapes bone. There's a ligament around the stapes bone to allow it to vibrate up and down so that sound waves can get into the inner ear. <clears throat> the round window is just a thin membrane, and it will push out as the stapes pushes in and vice versa. And the reason for the round window is to shunt sound waves to the cochlea so we can hear them by stimulating the hair cells in the cochlea. So those are the two normal mobile windows. In third mobile window uh, syndrome, there's another defect somewhere else in the inner ear. And again, the most commonly recognized one is superior semicircular canal dehiscence. In that disorder, there's an area where bone is missing over the superior semicircular canal. And because of that, there's a whole bunch of abnormal stimulation that can occur, leading to the symptoms of third mobile window syndrome. Other disorders that, or excuse me, but other uh, anatomic defects that can produce similar symptoms include a dehiscence of the posterior semicircular canal or the horizontal semicircular canal. There's also a, a, another common one that's called cochlear facial dehiscence, where the facial nerve uh, over the cochlea has an area where the bone is missing, is allowed for pressure transmission to occur. There's also a disorder that's long been recognized called large vestibular aqueduct syndrome. Uh, that one can be of varying degrees, but uh, the most common way you will hear about it is in young children who quickly become deaf as a result of it. But there are minor uh, variations on it that can cause much less problems and even issues that don't cause hearing loss but cause problems with vertigo and dizziness. You can see a dehiscence where the cochlea uh, is next to the carotid artery, and that one you often hear about a lot of pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, there's another type you can see when the jugular bulb, which is the big giant uh, vein that drains blood from the brain, comes up next to the inner ear, and you can see dehiscences between that and the posterior canal and other areas of the inner ear. Um, you can also see abnormal defects from the internal auditory canal to the inner ear that can cause similar symptoms. And lastly, you can see uh, defects of the, the oval and round window themselves that can cause these uh, third mobile window syndromes. That includes a really thin stapes footplate 
uh, to, to the point where it's so thin, it's membranous, we'll call it, or hypermobile. And then the, the last big one uh, that you can consider is something called a paralymphatic fistula, where you've actually got a breach of the round or the oval window. Well, what are the symptoms of third mobile window syndrome? And keep in mind, syndrome uh, doesn't necessarily mean a disease itself. It's not a particular diagnosis, but it is a collection of symptoms frequently seen together. And the most common symptoms we see with third mobile window syndrome are the following. We see pulsatile tinnitus, which is basically hearing your heartbeat in your ear. If you have pulsatile tinnitus, tinnitus that comes and goes, easy way to figure out if it's coming from your heartbeat is to take your pulse and see does the, the pulsatile tinnitus go in time with your heartbeat. There's something called autophony that's common with this disorder where the, your voice will sound abnormally loud in your ear or maybe distorted. Uh, there's another th uh, condition closely related where you can hear other internal sounds in the inner ear, uh, such as you're blinking. You know, believe it or not, some people with this disorder can actually hear their eyes move or hear themselves blink, that sort of thing. Uh, they'll hear swallowing and chewing abnormally loud. Some of these folks will hear joint movements such as like their shoulder joint or hip joints or or hear, hear their heels hit the ground as they walk and talk about inside their head, not outside the head. Those are sort of the, mo the most <clears throat> characteristic um, auditory symptoms we see with third mobile window syndrome. Now, there's also vertigo, dizziness, imbalance problems we see, and the, the most characteristic are strain-induced vertigo and dizziness. And by that, I mean if someone blows their nose real hard, strains real hard to uh, pick up something heavy, uh, strains real hard uh, if they're constipated on the, on the toilet, uh, or anything where they're straining while holding their breath, and that inducing vertigo or dizziness is a very characteristic finding of this disorder. And the other one is something also that a lot of people find unusual is something we call Tulio's phenomenon, which is sound-induced vertigo and dizziness. These folks will have certain pitches of sound will provoke vertigo and dizziness. It's usually pretty short-lived during the exposure to the sound. Most commonly, it's low-pitch sound that will provoke this, although there are some folks that will have high-pitch Tulio's phenomenon. There's a host of other disorders that we can see that are associated, excuse me, there's a host of other symptoms we can see that are associated with third mobile window syndrome, but they're not quite as specific as the ones we mentioned above or not quite as characteristic. Uh, for example, um, a lot of folks will feel like they're on a boat and they're rocking back and forth. That's one thing we will see. We'll see something called oscillopsy and that when they move their head, the horizon will move with them or the the objects in the room will move with them. Fullness or pressure in the ear. Uh, sound discomfort or noise intolerance, also called hyperacusis, is common with this disorder. Uh, we can see uh, uh, much more severe vertigo spells that will mimic Meniere's syndrome. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Meniere's syndrome, we have a whole video on that as well that I would direct you to. Um, good friend of mine uh, once described uh, superior semicircular canal dehiscence as the great otologic mimicker. And the reason for that is it can mimic many of the other inner ear disorders that we see, including otosclerosis, uh, vestibular neuritis, Meniere's disease, um, sudden sensory neural hearing loss, as well as a bunch of other things. And it's also important to point out that you can have an anatomic defect of the inner ear, such as superior semicircular canal dehiscence, and have absolutely no symptoms at all. It is not always present and may not be present throughout your entire life, but there are certain things that will provoke the symptoms. Um, there's other uh, symptoms we can also see associated with that are kind of associated with recurrent vestibular disorders, including nausea, vomiting, anxiety, brain fog uh, as well. 
Uh, brain fog is something that we have found is pretty uh, common among patients with chronic uh, third mobile window syndrome. The good news with that is it's often reversible with treatment. Um, the other important thing to keep in mind is, as I mentioned, it, you, just because you have a defect in your inner ear, uh, it doesn't mean you will have symptoms. And, and very often these defects are things that you've had your whole life, and you may not have developed symptoms until you're in your 30s or 40s or beyond. And the, what we find is there's often a second event that will provoke the onset of symptoms. Think of it this way, that if you've got a superior semicircular canal dehiscence or some other third mobile window defect, your ears are fragile and they're more sensitive to certain things and this second event can then provoke the symptoms. And the most common second event is trauma. And you can break up trauma into internal versus external. And by external, I mean getting hit in the head, uh, think concussions, uh, think, uh, and, and this is very common to see this onset after a concussion, um, being hit in the head. You don't have to get a concussion for this to happen, but any external trauma to the head. You can also see any kind of major pressure altering event uh, can provoke this. Think uh, barrow trauma like in a plane or scuba diving. Uh, we can also see it with women who are straining real hard for uh, a prolonged vaginal delivery weightlifters who are straining uh, like at the bench press, that sort of thing. Um, that's pro the most common inciting event. Uh, roughly 50 to 60 percent of folks that have third mobile window syndrome, they will see this as uh, the starting point for their symptoms. The interesting thing is, the, let's say you get hit in the head, you don't get the third mobile window syndrome right away. We only see that in about maybe a third of the folks will develop it right away. The other two thirds, it slowly develops over time and cannot be kind of like fully present maybe for another couple years, uh, but they can link it to the onset of that head injury. Uh, one last big factor associated with increased, uh, excuse me, uh, with third mobile window syndrome is increased intracranial pressure. And uh, there's a whole a uh, host of things you can see with increased intracranial pressure, but if someone has an anatomic defect of their inner ear and the intracranial pressure, the pressure inside your head, goes up, it increases the chance of them developing this third mobile window syndrome. So that said, how do we make the diagnosis uh, of someone with third mobile window syndrome? First, we look at the history. If someone's got these symptoms that we just discussed, uh, then we do testing to see if there is some objective measurement we can identify on the testing to identify third mobile window syndrome. And the last is a CT scan to look for an anatomic defect. Among the tests that we do, the first is a hearing test or audiometry. Some folks will have uh, findings on their hearing tests that will show us uh, evidence suggestive of a third mobile window syndrome. And technically, uh, it's called a pseudoconductive hearing loss. And typically in the low frequencies, the patients will hear bone conducted scores or internal sounds louder than they will hear stuff outside. And it's it's something that if you're not familiar with audiometry, don't worry about it. We see that in about a third of the patients, two thirds don't have any evidence of that. Um, the next thing we do is vestibular function test and provocative test. And the purpose for that is number one, the, the vestibular function tests are to check and see, do, is there any damage to the inner ear of uh, vestibular function or balance function? Uh, the provocative tests are to look to see, are there any signs of a third mobile window syndrome? And the ones we especially look at for third mobile window syndrome are something called a Tulios test, where we introduce sound in the ear and look for nystagmus. We'll have the patient do the Valsalva maneuver, which is holding your breath and straining while we look for nystagmus, or hold their nose and blow hard and look for nystagmus. 
We can also do something called the fistula test or pressure test where we put pressure in the ear canal and we look to see if that can move their eyes. Um, and then the last uh, uh, big one is the vestibular evoke myogenic potential test. And that's a test where it's done in the soundproof booth. We put sound in the ear and we measure some responses from stimulation of the gravity sensors. And in third mobile window syndrome, the gravity sensors are much more sensitive to sound and we can measure those responses. And there's certain levels that are normal and abnormal. Last uh, for uh, testing, I think in anybody who has third mobile window syndrome, you have to do some sort of assessment to see do they have high intracranial pressure. We find about 25 or 30 percent of our patients with third mobile window syndrome have high intracranial pressure. And finding that is more than just an academic point because correcting that problem often makes the third mobile window syndrome better. And then, of course, last is imaging. We, we get an MRI scan mainly to look for uh, other problems that could at essentially attribute to these symptoms. But also, the MRI scan can be useful. Even though it doesn't show pressure, it can show you some subtle signs that suggest the pressure is high. We also look for Chiari malformation, which is a higher incidence in patients with third mobile window syndrome. Uh, as well as cysts or tumors, that sort of thing. The CAT scan is, looked, uh, is used to look for defects of your inner ear. And specifically, we're, we need a very thin sliced CAT scan. And uh, if it's too thick, it will not be useful. Uh, and that's why we're very uh, particular about the CAT scan. So in summary, the diagnosis relies on basically three things. First, the history and symptoms. Second is the objective testing. And lastly, the imaging findings. And in patients that have no imaging findings, they are likely one of these folks that has either a, uh, a window defect, a perilymphatic fistula, or an internal canal uh, audit, uh, problem or possibly elevated intracranial pressure. So this concludes the first part of the third mobile window uh, syndrome video. In part two, we're going to talk about treatment. Thank you.